It's about time to get started this morning. Uh, we are in a new month and a new quarter. And in this quarter, I thought that we'd come back to the uh, long running run through of the historical books. And you know, I mean, because we did for a long time, we've been doing Genesis through Second Kings. And then we did Daniel, which is kind of the what happened during the exile. So this quarter, I thought we'd do Ezra and Nehemiah, and if time permits, maybe even some of the other uh, post-exile books. Uh, but this morning, we're going to start Ezra, and we're going to kind of have an introduction to Ezra and Nehemiah together. And But before we do that, even, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you have called us out of darkness, out of our captivity towards sin, and that you have called us to be your people for your own possession. We pray, Father, that you will help us as we build up as living stones in your holy temple so that we may offer spiritual sacrifices to you. We ask you, Father, that you will help us, that you will help us to study your word, to study the scriptures, to see the application that they have to our lives, and most importantly, to help us better know you, the God who made us as a people for his own possession. Restore our hearts to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ezra and Nehemiah, um, really, they need to be looked at together because they were originally one book. Um, and, you know, I mean, different... Can I think that the, the idea of separating Ezra and Nehemiah into two separate books goes back to the Greeks. Uh, but in the Hebrew Bible, they were originally one book just called Ezra and Nehemiah, because we were creative. And other books of the Bible uh, may have been written later, but Ezra and Nehemiah is taking us to the, very much the chronological end of the Old Testament history. Um, and in fact, uh, there's, a, you know, there's that famous quote from Josephus where he talks about how uh, the prophet... Uh, he says, since the reign of Artaxerxes, the Persian king, there has not been an exact succession of prophets. And the idea, Artaxer the reign of Artaxerxes, the king... Uh, was presumably the time in which uh, Malachi was prophesying, but also definitely the time in which Nehemiah was engaging in his exploits and uh, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And so he's kind of thought to mark the end of the Old Testament period in a lot of ways. The people of Israel really messed stuff up during their history. Uh, and you know that from just reading the Old Testament. You know, we're reading in our uh, Tuesday night Bible readings at Panera. We're, we just uh, they just finished the book of Joshua. We're going to be starting Judges this week, and um, I say they because I wasn't there for the end of Joshua. But uh, we're going to be starting Judges this week, and that's just going to be a whole cycle of apostasy and sin and disaster for the people of Israel. Because the truth is that they invaded Canaan and Joshua only to become Canaan in the book of Judges. Uh, in Samuel, they established a kingdom only to have that kingdom divided in kings. Uh, and despite the constant warnings of the prophets, the people refused to stop worshipping idols. They would worship golden calves, which Jeroboam had set up. They would worship Baal. They would worship the Asherah. They would worship Molech. They would just, I mean, just about everything that could, you could think of. They were engaged in it. They were worshipping the false gods. They turned to every possible direction to save themselves except to the God who made them, who actually gave them the promised land, who first brought them out of the land of Egypt. And God sent prophet after prophet to them to save them, and they wouldn't listen. And so eventually what happened? They were sent into exile. God sent King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was rising to power, establishing the Neo-Babylonian Empire in the ancient world. And Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and he captured it and he destroyed the city and he burned the temple and he took the people into exile in Babylon. Israel had once taken the land and now they have lost the land. They built the temple, the temple got burned. The Lord swore to establish the throne of David forever. Well, no more throne of David. It's lost. And Zedekiah was the last of the kings. And really, I mean, if you want to uh, get nitpicky, um, you could almost argue that Jeconiah, his predecessor, was the last of the Davidic kings, and Zedekiah was just kind of his uncle who was set up and then eventually just deposed. Uh, but I'm not going to quibble either way. Um, in Deuteronomy 28, the Lord had promised to do these very things to Israel. 
if they would not listen to Him, if they would not heed His voice, if they would not obey His words and keep His covenant, what would happen? In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young. Moreover, it shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed, who also leaves you no grain, new wine, or oil, nor the increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. It shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land. And it shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. And, I mean, ultimately what happens in verse 58... Uh, and verse, well, not verse 58. What eventually happens in verse 64, Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you have not known, nor your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. Uh, He describes them going back to Egypt to sell themselves into slavery and nobody's willing to buy them, which is just the most pathetic possible end that they could reach. Um, People were banished to the land of bondage from whence they came. Now, Israel did not literally go to Egypt. Well, some of the people who were left in Israel eventually went to Egypt, despite Jeremiah saying, don't go to Egypt. So even after the exile ended, they still wouldn't listen to the prophets. But for the most part, no, Israel did not literally return to Egypt. They were sent to exile into uh, Assyria for the northern ten tribes. Uh, And Assyria kind of really had more the practice of scattering them in a broad area. And then Babylon also, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, was taken into exile to Babylon. Now that could be the end of the story. But it's not. Because Deuteronomy, in addition to curses of the covenant, also had a statement about what would happen if the people decided to turn back to the Lord. What would happen if the people decided that they wanted to make themselves right? In Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, it says, It shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there He will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it and He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And... There's a lot more in this passage, uh, which we won't read for the sake of time. God promised circumstances in which Israel could return from captivity. What did they need to do to return from captivity? They needed to obey. They needed to return to the Lord. If they want to return from captivity, they first need to return to the God who sent them there. Return to the Lord with all their heart. The prophets speak about this pretty extensively. Isaiah, pretty much everything from Isaiah 40 onwards is, you know, at some level dealing with this situation. Uh, you know, because Isaiah 39, when Hezekiah shows all of his treasures to Merodach Baladan, the king of Babylon, and Isaiah comes and asks him afterwards, well, what were those people doing here? He says, well, I showed them everything that was in my house. And Isaiah says, there's a day coming when the Babylonians are going to show up and they're going to take you, or they're going to take your sons, rather, because you're not going to be there for it. They're going to take your sons, they're going to take all these treasures that you've shown them, and they're all going to be taken to Babylon. Your sons will become servants in the house of the king of Babylon. This place will get plundered. You know, As if to say, you know, Hezekiah, by showing this stuff to the Babylonians, you've kind of painted a big bullseye on the nation. But Isaiah 40 begins with this message of comforting the people, As if to say there's going to be an end to this type of exile. And in Isaiah chapter 40, you know, particularly in verse 2, 
is to speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, let every mountain and hill be made low, let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now that statement about the voice crying in the wilderness, uh, we're going to talk about how that applies to the New Testament character of John the Baptist in this morning's sermon. But first and foremost, when Isaiah first talked about it, it's describing a situation in which the people are being brought out of a a kind of a second exodus, if you will, uh, return from exile. The Lord's clearing a path in the wilderness for them to return from Babylon to their home in Jerusalem. Jeremiah likewise spoke of an end to captivity. In Jeremiah, in uh, two different places, he talks about the idea of a 70-year exile. In Jeremiah chapter 25, in verse 11, Jeremiah writes a, uh, this statement, that this whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words which I pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against the nations. Uh, So there, he's saying, yes, everybody's going to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years, and at the end of that time, I'm going to punish the king of Babylon. I'm going to judge the nation that oppressed my people. Again, in Jeremiah chapter 29, Jeremiah himself wrote a letter to the exiles who were living in Babylon and told them, Get comfortable. You're going to be here for a while. Build houses. Plant gardens. Have children. Get married to have the children. Seek the welfare of the city into which I've sent you in exile. Why? Because in Jeremiah 29, in verse 10, it says that, Thus says the Lord, When seventy years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and come pray to me and I will listen to you. You know, you've got to love how everybody takes verse 11 out of context. It's talking about the return from exile in particular. You know, A plan that God has... It's not like you know God has this you know, secret plan for their lives they never told anybody about. The plan was written in Deuteronomy. Bring them back from exile. But ultimately, of course, the principle behind this is that, well, you know, the Lord ultimately wants to save His people. He wants to do good to His people. He's not really desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God will go to whatever lengths are necessary to get some of His people back. To get as many of His people back as He can. And if it means sending them into exile to do it, and that's the price of their salvation. Mm-hmm. Hard time. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, Jeremiah is very much the mindset. Um, you know, everything he writes to the exiles. You know, get comfortable, get situated. There's going to be an end to this. But, you know, the people who are still living in the land, well, they've got a different story. It's much worse for the people who got left behind, actually. You know, because, I mean, the people who weren't taken into exile with uh, Jeconiah, they wound up having to endure the siege of Jerusalem, which was terrible. And then, when... The people that were left behind even after that, well, I mean, they had to endure all the political upheaval and turmoil with Gedaliah's assassination. Uh, and they eventually went down to Egypt and all perished there. It was a disaster. You know, who really had it bad was Jeremiah because he was in that group. Uh, and Jeremiah never went into exile in Babylon. He had to kind of watch from the outside looking in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hosea. 
Yes, that. Yes, that's Hosea 2.15. That will give her the vineyards from there. The valley of Achor is a door of hope. She will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. I did, it literally fell open to that page. <laughs> I don't know how that... Yes, yes, clearly. He knew the plans that he, for this, that he had for this Bible class. Um, anyhow, Daniel prayed at... Daniel also, you know, when we study Daniel chapter 9, Daniel has that lengthy prayer where he prays towards Jerusalem. You know, what was he praying towards Jerusalem every day for? He was praying for return from exile. And you know, praying for the forgiveness of the Lord. He was invoking things like the covenant of Deuteronomy and the prophecies of Jeremiah. He was reading Jeremiah when he prayed that prayer and noticed that exile was supposed to be 70 years. One more thing, of course, to kind of add to all this, uh, these background scriptures, is what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. Um, which is not a great chapter division. But in Isaiah 44, I'm going to start in... uh, I'm just going to start in verse 24, because that's really kind of the beginning of this oracle. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord and the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness, confirming the word of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers. It is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited. And of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. I will raise up her ruins again. So clearly we're talking about you know this restoration from exile. Verse 27, It is I who says it to the depth of the sea, Be dried up, and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd. He will perform all my desire. He will, and he declares of Jerusalem, She will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand, to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name for the sake of Jacob my servant and Israel my chosen one. I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you. Though you have not known me, that men may know me from the rising to the setting of the sun, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Now, you look at what he says here, and he names Cyrus right in the middle of this thing. Specifically named Cyrus. It's a one of the most, and I mean Isaiah's writing like you know a couple hundred years before Cyrus ever shows up on the scene, before there's ever a Persian Empire, before there's really even a Neo Babylonian Empire. What happened here? Well, you know he's describing this end to the exile, and you know the larger context of Isaiah 40 uh, through 48. God's trying to make this point: He's superior to the idols because you know He can predict the future and they can't. He can explain the past and they can't. Um, and Cyrus is kind of offered as a test case and proof here, um, which this brings all this brings us to this final period of Israel's history, the Bible's history rather, um, and that is the post-exilic period. When I say the Bible's history, I mean the Old Testament Bible. Uh, Post-exilic, after the exile, everything that happens to Israel chronologically from the decree of Cyrus onward is what we call post-exilic. So what happens in the post-exilic period? What happens at the end of the exile? Okay, people come back from exile. Well, that's probably the biggest thing, you know. Post exile, people come back from exile. Uh, did all the people come back from exile? Only the ones that really wanted to serve God. Yeah, you know? which I mean raises all kinds of questions for Esther, Mordecai, and uh, that much. But um, 
Uh, in fact, some people have used that as an argument to say Esther and Mordecai weren't that great people because they didn't come back from exile. Um, you know, it's a. Uh, but you. Know, yeah, I mean, Esther, Esther kind of suffers from its own challenges as a book to interpret. And, I, you know, I do hope to get to Esther in this quarter if we finish Ezra and Nehemiah so we can talk about that book because it's very interesting in a lot of ways. Um. But the number of Jews that returned to Jerusalem and Judah, probably the minority, actually. Because what's going on? The Jews that stayed in the lands of exile, and some of them continued to practice their religion, though, even in their land of exile, you know, become known as a group called the Dispersion or uh, the Diaspora. And in fact, uh, the Diaspora is mentioned you know, a few times in the New Testament. You know, these Jews, they're scattered throughout all the known world. How'd they get there? Well, in large part, they owe it to the exile and to the migration and the other things that go with that. Um, you know, it's like uh, John 7 in verse 35, the Pharisees, uh, well, the Jews are hearing Jesus make these comments, you will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion amongst the Greeks, is he? And teach the Greeks, is he? And he's talking about, in this case, these Hellenistic Jews, these Greek uh, the dispersion that is out there. Uh, the term that they use there is actually a technical term used for Jews that were scattered abroad. Alright, so people come back from exile. What else happens? What else happens? The time after the exile. Well, I'm just I. There's not really a specific. Okay. Okay, all right. You know, so we have that going on. Um, certainly, there was a lot of uh, enemies and surrounding peoples there. I read something the other day, actually, that uh, was trying to make the case that um, you know, when, when Cyrus forms the province of Judah in that region, that he had to take land from other surrounding provinces to do it. And that kind of... Well, that's not going to endear you to the, the provinces that just lost land and the local governors. Uh, so, I mean, there's a, there's a thought that that provoked the enemies to... Uh, you know, try to oppose the Jews at every turn, to stop the building of their temple. Speaking of which, big thing that happens in the time of back, coming back from exile, the temple gets rebuilt. Um, and what kind of temple was it? It was a grand, glorious temple like Solomon built. Yeah, you know, it was an okay temple. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't like Solomon's temple. Yeah, I mean it's still I mean it's still a building, it's not the right. Yeah, we've kind of gone that way. The temple is very much a shadow of its former glory. Um, there's no Ark of the Covenant. There's no sacred fire falling from heaven. We're gonna read in Ezra, they didn't have the Urim and the Thummim. Whatever that was, they didn't have it. And uh, and perhaps most notably, every time a temple or a tabernacle is built in the Old Testament, what's the first thing they do with it? What that happens there? Right, they offer sacrifices, but what else? What does God do with it? Dedicates it. In Exodus 40, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In 1 Kings 6, the glory of... 1 Kings 6? 1 Kings 8, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In Ezra 6, nothing. The glory of the Lord does not fill the temple. And just, there's this idea that, you know, this, this glory of God, this presence of God comes and invades the temple and fills it up. It's like God moves into his house. He doesn't move into this temple. Which is significant. The temple is a shadow of its former glory. Well, it's part. I think it's part of that lesson. Certainly, uh, you know, the beginning of that lesson. Well, he's been kind of trying to teach them that the whole time. But, but you know, maybe you'll get it now. Is kind of you know. Here's a, here's a more extreme example of this idea. You know, you built this house. I don't have to move into it. Um, 
And in fact, but even then, you know, God keeps telling the people in the prophets, I will fill it with glory. Uh, Haggai, in particular, is very emphatic about this. This temple, you think it seems like a shadow of its former self? I will fill it with its glory. The latter glory will be greater than the former. Well, you, know, you kind of wonder, well, what happened with that? Um, and of course, you know, he's talking about something else ultimately. We have to look a little bit farther. We have to look a little bit further into the future to understand that the true glory of God that comes into the temple comes in the form of Jesus. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there's a reason that Malachi says, you know, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. He hadn't done it yet. In Malachi 3 and verse 1. But when Jesus, you know, the true glory of God came into the temple, the first thing he did was start kicking merchants out of it. Uh, um, all right, so the temple was rebuilt, and other things happened. Uh, this is the Persian Empire was what ruled the world, which we'll have more to say about them in a moment. Uh, this is the time where the term Jew starts to be used uh, as the main designation for the Hebrew people. They weren't really called the Jews before this point, but in the post-exilic time, they started to be called Jews, which is a derivative of the word Judah, because most of the people that came back from exile were from the tribe of Judah. There were exceptions to that. Uh, sometimes people from the ten tribes migrated into Judah and thus got carried off into exile to Babylon with them. And of course, there were Levites who came back as well. There were some Benjamites that came back. We know that Paul was a Benjamite. In uh, Philippians chapter 3, mentions it offhand. Also, the time of exile, there were some... Uh, there were books of the Bible that were written. What books of the Bible were written in the time of exile, besides the obvious Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're studying? Anybody know what books of the Bible we kind of associate with this time? Probably not Genesis. <laughs> They had well. That's an interesting question. I mean, they had lost the law, and then they found it in the time of Josiah, the King Josiah before the exile. Uh, now, you know, did they lose it again during the exile? I'm not sure. Um, there is something to the fact. There is something to the idea that um, that the Old Testament, as we know it, you know. Well, I mean, there is something in the fact that they're they're kind of reviving the law, if you will. They didn't write the law at this time because you know the law was written by Moses, but there was a, quite a bit of a revival going on, a kind of a, if you will, it, like in Nehemiah chapter eight, for instance. Um, in Nehemiah chapter eight, they get together, they have this big reading of the book of the law, and one of the things that they have to do at that reading. Uh, was in Nehemiah chapter eight. In verse, five, in verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood at the wooden podium which they had made for the purpose. Uh, verse 5, he opened the book in the sight of all the people. Uh, verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Uh, so there, you know, it's not only that we've got to read from the book of the law, but we actually have to translate it because uh, they don't really understand it at this point. Um, translation is a kind of a, a big issue at this point. Um... All right, so I mean, there's something in that. But what, what other books were really written during this period? Probably Esther. You know, Esther happened during the reign of the Persian king Xerxes. It's clearly post-exilic. What else? Chronicles. Yeah, we know. And here's an interesting thing: Chronicles. A lot of the stuff in Chronicles happens before the exile, but. It couldn't have been finished before the exile because the book assumes knowledge of post-exilic people in its genealogies. Uh, in 1 Chronicles 3, in verses 16 through 24, it talks about Zerubbabel. It talks about Zerubbabel's sons. You know, it talks about some guys that aren't even mentioned in Ezra and Nehemiah, but which dated to that period. So, you know, the, the, because Chronicles assumes that knowledge very, very early on in the book, it's safe to say Chronicles was probably written after the exile. Also, it mentions the decree of Cyrus at the end of it, which is, it ends the same way Ezra began. 
There's a lot of people that think Chronicles and Ezra were actually written by the same person. Um, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. I'll, you know. We can ask the Lord when we... Yeah, we... There you go. <laughs> hey, um, but, you know, you can ask the Lord when you see Him if you still think it's important. Uh, and um, also, think about some of the prophets. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi... Uh, some people also assign Joel to this period, although to be fair, some people assign Joel to every period throughout Bible history because nobody knows when it was written. Um, if I had to pick, I would put Joel post-exilic, but that's neither here nor there. Um, all right, so this is really kind of the point where you know the Old Testament really kind of finally starts to come together, you know, and kind of reach completion. There's a lot of thoughts, you know, that Ezra, was, Ezra, and those associated with him were very instrumental in compiling it together and. You know, so that we have a unified body of scripture that we can, you know, we actually get it in one place. Um, so, this is also the first time in Israel's history where they seem to have genuinely licked the problem of idolatry. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there's always spiritual idolatry and greed and things like that to contend with. But actually bowing down to little statues that you're hiding in your house, there doesn't seem to be a lot of that going on in the post-exilic community. Uh, the prophets rarely mention idolatry in this period. Zechariah might mention it in Zechariah 13, I think, in one place. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah don't really mention idolatry very much, except perhaps warning against you know getting seduced back into it. Uh, the people... So maybe the people finally got it. You know, you you committed all this idolatry. You went to exile. God finally let you come back from exile. Okay, new rule. We're not going to do that anymore. Well, I guess you finally got one thing. Now, are the people perfect in post-exile times? They finally figure everything out. We still haven't figured it out today. We haven't figured it out today. Uh, not really. Now, the people, I mean, you know, the people have a lot of problems in the post-exile time. They have problems intermarrying with foreigners. Nehemiah gets really upset with the people for exacting usurious interest from folks, for, pay, for not paying tithes to the Levites, for violating the Sabbath day. Malachi has a lot of stuff to say about, um, you know, offering bad sacrifices and people mistreating their wives. And say, I mean, the Jewish people became more religious. But that doesn't mean that they got rid of sin. Their problems, they still have problems measuring up to the Lord's expectations. You know. And just, just to think about that idea for a minute, if, you know, just because you don't commit this one really bad sin over here, doesn't mean you're perfect. doesn't mean you don't have stuff to work on. It's something that religious people need to realize. We talk about restoration. You know, some people talk about the history restoration movement. Let me tell you something. The real restoration movement is right here in the Old Testament. Ezra and Nehemiah. And all it was, it's very simple. People read the law of God. They said, oh, we haven't done that. We should start doing that. And then they restored themselves to God. That's restoration. And throughout the history of Christianity, throughout the history of God's people, there's, you know, there's always been the occasional effort to kind of go back to that, return to the Scripture as the authority, as the principal source of information about who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. So, I mean, by that definition, there have been quite a few restoration movements throughout history. But it's not finished. It's important to note that restoration isn't something, oh yeah, our fathers restored the church and fixed everything and now it's perfect. Well, if you think that, you've got the wrong idea. Restoration is an ongoing process, and it needs to be revisited with each successive generation. One of the worst things that Christians can do is just assume that their fathers and their grandfathers had everything figured out and had solved all the problems and figured out all the tough questions so we don't have to. That is the road to apostasy. The whole Old Testament should be a cautionary tale against that kind of thinking. How long did it take Israel to apostatize in the book of Judges? One generation. Sometimes not even that. Sometimes, you know, they got a head start and did it in the, yeah, at most one generation. I mean, and just to put things in perspective, that isn't a problem unique to the book of Judges. At, at the, towards the end of the book here, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 13. All right, so Nehemiah shows up. And Nehemiah's 
Ezra and Nehemiah, I love both of them because they illustrate such different different responses to problem solving. Ezra shows up, he sees the, the sin of the people, and he tears out his hair. Nehemiah shows up, he sees the sin of the people, he starts tearing out everybody else's hair. And both of them are presented as legitimate responses to the problem of sin, by the way. Um, but Nehemiah was a, a little bit more... I get the impression Nehemiah was a little bit more of an in-your-face man of action. Um, but in Nehemiah 13, he serves as governor for 12 years in Judah. And then he, he takes a brief trip back to Persia. Nehemiah 13... Um, All right, so I'm going to start reading in verse 4. Prior to this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him, where formerly they put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil prescribed for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. But during all this time I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king. After some time, however, I asked leave from the king, And I came back to Jerusalem. I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. It was very displeasing to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. And then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. He goes for a brief trip to Persia. And when he comes back, they've already started doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. Within the same generation. I mean, how long was Nehemiah gone? He doesn't even mention how long he's gone. Probably wasn't that significant of an amount of time. You know, he goes back to the king and he says, I want to go back and see my people again. And he shows back up and they're back in this mess. All over again. That was in his lifetime. How long does apostasy take? It doesn't take hardly any time at all. That's why God requires vigilance from us. Instead of, you know, just constantly say, yeah, you know, we everything, we we got everything figured out. Traditions are all right. You know, go back to the scriptures. Make sure we, we need to be ever vigilant about what the Bible says. Studying the scriptures. So there's a kind of a lot of things here to get into. You know, and the, the climax of the Old Testament story has Israel in a better situation, but there's a lot of loose ends. There's no king in Israel, despite the promises to establish David's dynasty forever. There's no divine presence in the temple, despite God's claim, I'm going to fill it with glory. The land doesn't really belong to Israel because it's ruled over by their Persian overlords. And the captivity isn't really over because a lot of people just flat out didn't come back. And there's no blessing on all the nations, despite the promise to Abraham. And there's no forgiveness of sin. Because the serpent still has rule over this world. Now in the end, of course, all of those loose ends I described are answered by Who ties up all those loose ends? No temple. No king. No no true possession of the land. Still in captivity. Sin. Who fixes all that? Hmm? Yeah? Yeah? But we're in Bible class. The answer to every question in Bible class is... Jesus! There you go! <laughs> Alright. Yes, Nancy. You know, Ezra and Nehemiah ends with a... Ezra and Nehemiah kind of ends with a simple look forward. The very last thing the book says in uh, verse uh, Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 31... I realize I've talked way more about Nehemiah than I have about Ezra this morning. I arranged for the supply of wood at the appointed times for my first fruit, uh, for the first fruits. Remember me, oh my God, for good. It's the last thing he says in the book. It kind of ends with this statement: "Remember me for good." Now, talk about some of the details of the books themselves. Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, there's these little first-person sections throughout. Sometimes it's clearly Ezra talking. Sometimes it's clearly Nehemiah talking. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, documentary inclusions. Uh, there's probably no book of the Bible that's as diligent about citing its sources as the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, you have a decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. You have letters between Artaxerxes and the enemies of the Jews. You have a letter of Tatnai to Darius. You have a decree of Darius to build the temple. You have a letter of Artaxerxes about Ezra. You have a signed document with a confession of sin and an oath to serve the Lord. Uh, 
you know, and who wrote it? Ezra, Nehemiah, these other guys. Well, I mean, we don't know who the final compiler is. We do know that, of course, the hand of the Lord is behind this. Um, we're talking about the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was founded by Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was originally king of a small state in the Persian Gulf called Anshan, and then he overthrew his lord, Asti. Astyages, however you say that, in 549 B.C. And he took the Median Empire from him. Uh, there were the Persians and then there were the Medeans. And they were two different groups of people, but uh, when Cyrus overthrew the Medeans, uh, he still left a lot of them in positions of power and in prominent government roles, which is why the empire was often referred to as the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus defeated Croesus of Lydia in 547 BC, and in 539 he captured the Babylonians without a real fight. The Babylonians were so confident that their city was an impenetrable fortress uh, that they didn't notice that uh, Cyrus had basically diverted the Euphrates River with various canals and then marched into the city through the drained river channel that ran through the city and took the city pretty much without a fight. Um killed the king Belshazzar. Cyrus claims... In, we actually have writings of Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus claims in a document called the Cyrus Cylinder, an inscription, that Marduk had given him victory and made him king of the world. And then Cyrus died and nine years later while he was trying to expand eastward. His son, Cambyses, added Egypt to the empire. Uh, eventually... Uh, they were succeeded by Darius the Great and then by Xerxes. Xerxes is otherwise known as Ahasuerus of the fame of the Book of Esther. But uh, Xerxes continued all of the wars of Cyrus by making a famous but ultimately fruitless expedition into Greece in 480. But all these men, you know, the empire they're building, we call it the Achaemenid Empire. And the Achaemenid Empire stretched east to India, west to Egypt, north to Anatolia. It was all over the map. It was a huge empire. It stood for a couple hundred years. What do we know about the Persians? Were they nice guys? Well, it depends on who you talk to, I guess. Well, actually, you know, even if you weren't a Persian, you know, you still got you still as empires go, they weren't that bad, all things considered. Uh, the Greek historians say nasty things about them, but that's because the Greeks hated the Persians. So, you know, you have kind of a, a source bias there. Um, but I'll tell you what the Persians did do. Uh, in general, they were much more tolerant of other people's religions. Um, they let folks keep. They even sometimes let folks keep their kings, providing they pay taxes and recognize the Persian king is the real king, the, the king of kings, if you will. Um, the predominant religion in Persia was a religion called Zoroastrianism, which still exists today in some circles. Uh, it was monotheistic. It didn't try very hard to convert people. And uh, it forbids slavery, which means that nobody in the empire was allowed to be a slave. So you have that. Uh, but all these factors combined to create a circumstance that was actually pretty favorable to post-exilic Israel because the Jews got to go home from exile. That's not something most imperial thinkers do. Uh, the Persians allowed the Jews to continue worshiping Yahweh. They didn't force them to submit to the Persian gods. They actually, I mean, in several places in Ezra and Nehemiah, they actually not only uh, tell the Jews, yeah, you can rebuild your temple, but also, oh, we want your enemies to help pay for it. <laughs> there you go. And that's the sort of thing that's going on. Um, so, you know, the, the Persians generally seem as friendly to the Jewish people throughout the Bible, despite Daniel's depiction of the empire as a bear and a ram and all that other stuff. Um, you had taxes, sure, but who doesn't? And, uh, you know, comparably low by comparison. And people can say what they want. Oh, you know, about... People can say what they want about Greeks in the West being so much more civilized than Persians in the East, but, I mean... You tell me who was more cruel to their, the people under, in their subjection. Well, I mean, history speaks for itself, frankly. Um, all right, so you have that kind of going on here. There's some other more technical things, which I just won't get into. Um, but I think that that's kind of a, a laying the groundwork for what's going to happen here in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. All right, so Thursday, we will pick up with Ezra chapter 1 and maybe look at chapter 2. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but just start reading the book of Ezra. Start reading the book of Nehemiah. There's going to be a lot of names. 
and a lot of lists, and uh, we'll try not to get too bogged down in that, but we do want to at least uh, pay attention to what the points of interest there. Anything before we close? All right, we'll pick up next time with Ezra chapter 1.